Welcome. Hope everyone's doing well tonight. Thank you for coming. We uh, looked a little bit like we might have a rain shower, but um, hopefully um, everybody will get out of here dry. We'll see. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our fall series of the Arts and Humanities um, programs. And uh, tonight we've got a special um, faculty spotlight. Uh, Denez Tuck, who has spoken for us before, um, will uh, give the talk tonight. And here to introduce her is Allison Daly, the Department Chair of Languages and Communication. And um, they're good friends, so I know this is going to be a, a good introduction. Y'all welcome, and um, next week, I will point this out. <laughs> next week, um, Tommy Jarrett over here is going to be our speaker, and it's a story of World War II, German saboteurs, and two hard, uh, Tar Heel lawyers. So that should be really good. So I don't know if you saw the pressure that she put me under. Um, and then Denez turns around and says, it better be. Right? <laughs> um, I have the honor of introducing Denez Tuck tonight. She is one of our superstars on campus, and we have many. But um, she has been a joy uh, in my life. I've known her a very long time, was her English teacher in high school. and. Um, she was also taking classes here, so she's a graduate of Wayne Community College, earned her associate in arts, and um, then went on to East Carolina University, where she distinguished herself there and was the distinguished graduate, and then earned her master's degree in English at NC State University. So when she came back home, she's homegrown. She's one of our lecture series where we actually have someone from our campus featured. We're very glad to share with you one of our bright stars. Um, when she came to uh, Wayne Community College as an instructor, uh, the students were really excited. <laughs> she was engaging. I was teaching at Wayne School of Engineering, and she came over and taught there the students um, at Wayne School of Engineering as a student, as a teacher here. And the students here were excited. She had interesting lessons. She brought in pop culture. She was entertaining. She was funny. And she was smart. And they had to stand up and take and pay attention. They couldn't slack off, even when they tried. And, um, and I would hear their stories like, Miss Daly, she's really smart. I have, I have to do all my homework. <laughs> and I thought, this is great. She has served as an advisor here at, at, for the honors program for a time, and her fingerprints are all over our campus. Um, when she's facing our students, she also plays a, plays a mean game of kickball. This year, Denez was selected for the community college leadership cohort, and um, this small team, with this small team, she is developing AI curriculum for the entire campus. Peers who work closely with her in the Languages and Communication Department have awarded her the 2021 Sharon E. Royal Award for Teaching Excellence, followed quickly by recognition by the campus as a whole as the 2021 Bell Distinguished Chair which is to say she is, an, she is a thoughtful and effective asset to Wayne Community College and to our community. Our speaker tonight is also no stranger to the Foundation Lecture Series. Many of you will remember her exegesis of the Book of Job, the story we are in, the Book of Job, Suffering, and You, where Denez pointed us, her audience, to enriched understandings of a complex, often misunderstood biblical text and the moments of moral beauty it inspired in films like The Tree of Life. Tonight's lecture is a talk in search of the right audience. It's a talk about Rocky, but it's meant for you. 
And I know that I join you in welcoming Denez Tuck to our stage where she will delight, provoke, and energize us to understand this film in ways and see things in it that we have never seen before. We'll never see it the same way again. Thank you. Please welcome Denez. All right, thank you, Allison and Charlotte. So Allison mentioned that she was my senior English teacher, and she was, and my senior year, she gave me, what was it? Like a 19 on a paper out of 100, <laughs> because I was super busy with volleyball and did not have a time, I thought, to write a paper about the meaning of the fool and 12th night or something, whatever. And um, the day that it was due was in denial, and I was like, I can get it done before second period, <laughs> and did not. And I remember going up to Allison, Miss Daly, please, I, I can do this better. And she was like, no. And I was like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> anyway, so she was one of my favorite traumatizing teachers, and it was such a joy when she came to join Wayne Community College, coming in as a colleague first for me, and then as a department chair, it's been really fun. So thank you guys for coming out. I'm especially appreciative of my students who have come because you have an intrinsic love of film or because you want extra credit, whatever the case may be. I'm happy to see your faces here. I'm also happy to see people from the Global Scholars Program, my mom and Miss Joanne, a friend I grew up with, um, and all of you. I remember some of you from my previous talk, and so it means a lot to me that you would uh, have the guts to come out and hear it again. Um, so we're gonna just go ahead and get started here. And you see the title, um, Rocky, the underdog story behind the beloved underdog film. So <clears throat> a few years ago in my um, writing and research class, I chose Rocky as the basis of a research project because if you teach English 111 and English 112, you gotta get one for you, right? You gotta do something that you want instead of just focusing on like MLA and APA and all that. So at the beginning of the semester, when I tell my students that this is the film that we'd be watching, their responses were predictable. Students would be like, it's my dad's favorite movie. I don't wanna watch a movie all the way from the 1970s. Um, and that was supposed to hurt some of y'all's feelings in here. Um, so I could see their souls withering when I told them we were gonna watch an older film. And I first saw the film in my early 20s when my husband and I were, um, when we were dating, he recommended Rocky one night. And I was like, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it's meant for me. It's a cliche sports movie, right? And I was reminded of that scene in Barbie, the new Greta Gerwig movie, where all the Kens are like, the Godfather, and the Barbies are like, okay, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so he made a case to watch Rocky. He says, it's not what you think it is. And so I gave the movie a shot and ended up agreeing that it's not what you think it's going to be. And semester after semester, my students felt the same thing, realized the same thing. So when you watch Rocky for the first time, you realize that it's not about boxing or winning. It's about people. It's about people who are broken, people who are losers <laughs> or feel like they're losers, people who are trying to recover some scrap of dignity in a life where they feel degraded or unloved or the very worst is unlovable. So in the end, we're happy for them when they recognize that something beyond misery is available to them. We are happy to hear Rocky shouting for Adrian in the film's biggest moment, to hear this public recognition and confession that love is what brings us to a better way of being in the world. So Rocky is about hope, it's about resurrection. It is in its own way a testament to a secular gospel of perseverance and self-belief, things that we really love as Americans. And these are some of the reasons why um, the film is as admired as it is. And it's why when Burt Young and Carl Weathers passed away in the previous years, we were a little more sorrowful than usual when performers die. These players were part of a larger than life story that for almost 50 years has been an important shaper of um, our collective imagination. The image of Rocky in the ring is a powerful iconography we associate with the American dream. And it's an image that some campaigns have co-opted and 
photoshopped their own faces in there as if they were that kind of hero too. The movie status as a classic doesn't need to be decided, so I'm not here to convince you that Rocky is a classic. However, I am here to tell you that Rocky is a classic that almost wasn't. The movie about one of our favorite underdogs is a film that nearly didn't get made. The tales of Stallone's generation of the screenplay, the struggles during production, and its sleeper success at the 49th Oscars are the stuff of Hollywood legend. So this is the ground we'll be covering tonight. And it's possible you've been, that you are here without having seen Rocky, or maybe like Allison, you saw it yesterday for the first time in your life. <laughs> um, and if you're like her, you've neglected your, your responsibility as a consumer of American popular media and have not, um, or maybe you've not seen it from start to finish. Whatever the case is, I wanna take a few moments to give you a smidge of context so that you can at least play along like with what we're talking about. Um, so our first point here is that Rocky was written by Stallone himself, and this is really, really important for you to understand in order to appreciate the film for what it is. It was di uh, directed by John um, Abeldson, released in 76, which was important because it is the year of the um, country's bicentennial, the country's 200th anniversary. Um, the story spans a little over one month of Rocky's life from Thanksgiving to New Year's Day, which is a very, a very special time for movies to be set. It's a magical part of the year, and I tend to like movies that cover that ground, whether they're rom-coms or whatever. So this falls in line with that. So here are our principal characters and performers. Rocky Balboa um, is played by Sylvester Stallone. He's a 30-year-old working class guy. During the day, he works as enforcement for the mob, like collecting money for a loan shark. But he's bad at this job because he's too nice. So like he'll track down people at the shipyards and be like, yo, you owe people money. That's my impression, right? <laughs> And they're like, I don't have it. And he's supposed to break the guy's fingers and he just can't do it, you know, because he's too sweet. Um, and at night, he boxes low tier um, other fighters. And um, he gets booed at all these things. He's very clumsy and sloppy in the ring, but he gets the job done. He's awkward and he's corny. He's not at all cool. And he struggles with a deep sense of worthlessness. So there are a lot of times in the beginning of the film where he's reflecting out loud that he's just some bum, some loser. Rocky's in love with Adrian Panino, who's played by Talia Shire, which you might recognize from the Godfather movies. Um, she's a pet shop clerk who works near his gym. He has bought a fish and some turtles, probably just to go buy food for them over and over again so he can hang out with her. Um, he pops into the shop and will tell her jokes that he has rehearsed. She's too shy to know to laugh at them, but she pays him just enough attention that he persists and um, he feels encouraged by her restrained attention to him. Polly Panino is played by Burt Young, and he is probably the most unlikable character in the whole film. Um, he's a friend of Rocky who wants to get out of his job in the meat processing plant, and he wants to work with the mob like Rocky does, but Rocky wants to shield him from this life um, and Polly himself is verbally, emotionally, and physically abusive to Adrian. These are the most difficult parts of the film to watch. Um, but he depends upon Adrian for all of his domestic care. Um, and even by, it's clear by all accounts that he resents his sister, doesn't like her. He still sets her up with Rocky and this changes the course of her life. Um, Apollo Creed is played by Carl Weathers. He's the reigning heavyweight champion of the world, trying to get together an exhibition match to celebrate the 200 year anniversary. But the problem is, is that the opponent that he has lined up has been injured, and so they're scrambling to find a replacement. And so Creed is flipping through a directory of local fighters and picks Rocky simply for his name, which is the Italian Stallion. He recognizes that this has a lot of marketing power, and he's aware of the racial dynamics here too, and he says Americans are not racist, but sentimental, right? And will latch on to the fight because of this. Mickey Goldsmith is played by Burgess Meredith. Um, he's a former boxer turned grizzled uh, trainer. He's frustrated with Rocky because he thinks that Rocky lacks the discipline to become a good fighter. Um, he knows that Rocky could have been great, but now Mickey has moved on and he's focusing on other fighters. 
And the healing of the relationship between Mickey and Rocky is pretty fundamental for setting the story or allowing it to move forward. And it's one of the pieces of the story that I like a lot. So here we have the structure of the narrative. It is a very simple story, but it is not balanced in the way that you would think a movie with boxing would be balanced. It's a three act kind of structure. We have the exposition where we're getting to know the characters, what the status quo of their world is, what, the, what they're motivated by, what the central conflicts are. We are introduced to them and you see that takes a whole hour. <laughs> And this drives my students crazy, or it did when we used to watch it, and they were like, where are they gonna fight? And I'm like, that's not what this movie's about, right? Um, but it's, I, the movie has such a strong and long history of reception that we think of it as a fighting movie, but it's a character drama. So we have a whole hour of exposition, and then the drama changes when we have this inciting incident we'll talk about in a minute that drives the action upward and raises the stakes, leading us to a mere 15 minutes of a boxing match. Um, so this is what the structure looks like. These are some of um, some moments from the exposition where we're getting to know our characters. Up in the top, we have Rocky, who has just beat Spider Rico, but everyone was booing him as he was winning, and he's immediately smoking a cigarette and drinking a beer afterward to recover. So he's in peak athletic form, right? <laughs> the body is a temple for him. Um, he gets paid forty dollars for this fight. It's no way to make a living and we see how down and out he is. The next um, <clears throat> image we see of him and Adrian at the pet shop, you see she's got the glasses on, which in this movie is an irritating sign that she's shy, right? <laughs> and as a sometimes glasses wearer myself, I don't like this way to characterize people, right? Glasses wearers, <laughs> like you're confident too. Um, there's even a moment later in the scene below where he's like, takes off her glasses and he says, I always knew you were pretty. <laughs> I don't like that, right? But we, I love the movie as a whole, okay? Um, but not that moment. Anyway, so eventually they go out on this date on Thanksgiving and we have this scene here, the ice skating rink, which is one of another really great moment, a set piece in the film. We'll talk about this moment later too. So back at the apartment, they are actually able to connect. And if you have seen the film, you would recognize this now as kind of a complicated moment that if the film were made today, it would look a lot different because he does push past her initial no about coming into his apartment. But what I tried to show my students is in this moment we're looking at here, the whole scene um, where they, but right before they kiss happens in close up. And it's an extreme, no, well, not extreme, because it's not like right on their eyeballs or mouths, right? But it's, it happens in close up. And the camera actually prioritizes her in all of the shots. So the, the, this scene where they connect is actually emphasizing her responsiveness and her consent, even though it's not how we would probably do it today. Um, but anyway, this is a, an important moment for her because she's being really vulnerable, as you can tell, because she doesn't have her glasses, okay? Um, down at the bottom, we have Creed dealing with the frustration of not being able to have a fighting partner, and so he's finding the name. Um, what we're, we're introduced to Creed early in the film as he's a businessman. We know he's an incredible athlete, but he is great on camera. He's great negotiating his own business, and we see him as living the kind of life that is very different from Rocky himself. So in the final frame here, we have Mickey passing on the news to Rocky that Creed's people want to talk to him, but he thinks Creed is just looking for a sparring partner. He has no idea that his life is about to change. So then we come to our inciting incident. I want to get rid of this little menu down here at the bottom. Go away. Okay, there we go. Well, we get to this inciting incident. I should just start over, right? Okay. <laughs> um, the inciting incident, which changes the trajectory of the story. And it is, it is a wonderfully blocked and shot scene. So Jurgens comes in with his pinstripe three-piece suit, his hands in his waistcoat. And his, um, he's the fight promoter, and he's giving Rocky the proposal to fight with Creed. Immediately... Rocky's answer is, no, no. He says it without any hesitation. 
But we draw, when we would watch this as a class, we'd pay attention to the blocking of the figures because it emphasizes Rocky's smallness and sense of powerlessness. It's also some kind of class judgment. Um, but then Jurgens persists and is like, you know, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. And we get a um, slow pan into Rocky as he's contemplating, uh, not pan, but Dolly into Rocky as he's contemplating the option. And you can tell that he's terrified because now he actually has to do something. He's been worried that his life doesn't mean anything and that he has no value. And now, like, he, you can feel that way, right? But then it's different when you have the option to figure out otherwise. Then the stakes are really high and um, he can no longer avoid this question about what he's worth. And that slow dolly in is a pattern of camera movement in Rocky that happens at times where we're meant to see the characters making a very important decision or being really vulnerable. Um, it brings us intimately into focusing on their decision-making process. So that kicks off the rising action, which lasts for 45 minutes. The, the um, pressure is building for our big moment. And in the early... Um, Parts of the rising action, what must get settled is the broken relationship between Mickey and Rocky, which we see in the first two frames. This is my favorite moment in the whole film. And have you, if you've seen it and you like this moment, raise your hand so I know who to favor in class. <laughs> okay, this is a great moment is because it's very subdued and then it gets really loud and both actors are really doing terrific things to bring these moments to life. We'll talk about it later. Um, but then after they repair their relationship, we have these iconic scenes early on where he's chugging the eggs, which now when I watch it, sometimes I'm just like, I can't see it. You know, I don't think I'm a very sensitive person, but this grosses me out. Um, and then we see him running up the steps of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and he's lumbering down there like all of us would if we were trying to get down those steps. He's got a stitch in his side, and he's holding it. But things start to pick up a little bit, and he visits um, Polly at the meat processing plant. We get this moment. Um, here, Mickey's telling him that women weaken legs. And so uh, this is building up to those iconic training sequences that would become distinctive for all the films after and would come to be a staple of action movies um, in the 80s. So this is from the famous montage where we have Bill Conti's um, song playing over it where the lyrics are sort of artless and they're like, trying hard now, feeling strong now. Like these aren't beautiful lyrics and they're a little on the nose, but it really works in the moment because the instrumentation, right? There's lots of horns and we get a sense of uh, Rocky's heroicism. So he's running back in the shipyards. Here, we're gonna talk about this moment on the upper right where he's running down the um, Philadelphia Italian market, doing well with the speed bag doing the one-arm push-ups, the impossible sit-ups, and really booking it down on the docks where he used to be really bad at collecting money from other people. And that culminates in this, well, we're not there yet. I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, while he's improving his physical condition, his relationship with Adrian, so important for his growth and sense of wholeness in the film, is also developing. So I want to be sure that we don't understand Adrian as some what other critics have called manic pixie dream girl, who exists in a story as a way to make the male protagonist understand himself better. Are you guys familiar with this trope? It's a supporting female character that seems to exist only for the further characterization of the male, right? So um, you might think of Garden State or something where there's like this quirky, cute little girl, and she's like, let's just be crazy, right? And then it helps him come into himself. I don't want to cast her as that because I think much of this movie is just as much about her own sense of comfort with who she is and the kind of relationship they, that they have is not him bringing her out of some pit or her bringing him out. It is a complementary kind of love and I find that very nice, right? <laughs> so here, um, She's growing impatient with Polly, her roommate, her brother, and is ready to get out. And eventually they do move in together. And this scene is cute here because she returned, or she uh, gives Butkus the dog to him, which we will talk about later. 
Um, and he's and here he's bobbing around and he says, yo, you look great, <laughs> you know? And so she feels super confident in herself. And I'm just now realizing that all those impressions are recorded so I can hear them again. Um, right, so their romance is blooming an important part of both of their character development. And then this really grainy gif here is of him going back up the steps. But what this does is bookend the training montage or the whole training sequence in the rising action so that we see he actually has made lots of improvements. He gets at the top, he raises the hands, he does a little dance, right? Um, and this is the scene that we know so well. So um, <clears throat> the night before the fight, Rocky has a bout of anxiety. He visits the Spectrum Arena where he's gonna take on Creed. The confidence that he's worked so hard to achieve that we saw in the previous scene is now starting to recede, it's starting to wane. And back at home with a sleepy Adrian, he has to recalibrate his role. And he's no longer thinking that he must win this fight in order to have some sense of dignity. His goal is just to go toe to toe with Creed for as long as he can, hopefully all 15 rounds, um, so that when he's still standing at the end of it, he knows he has some value, that he's not his worst fear, which is to be just some other bum from um, the neighborhood. Just some trivia about this, which Amazon Prime, if you have the x-ray view of trivia on the side, will tell you, is that this um, scene here is done in one take. We start with the camera very far across the room and we get that very slow dolly in like we had earlier when he makes the decision to accept the fight. He does this whole thing without blinking and it's like two minutes long and every time I watch it, I'm like, maybe he'll do it this time, right? But it's really intense and he's just, he's, he's not, it's not a raw, raw moment. It's just, it's very anchoring for him to say that all he wants to do is to be standing. Now he did this in one take and this was a scene that the producers were like, this is boring, we don't need this. But Stallone, having written the character and believing in the story, knew this was an important moment. And so he fought to keep it in. He said, give me just one try. They didn't want to do it because they were behind schedule. And I'm glad that they worked it in because it's a, it's a pretty important moment. So the climax of the film, we're finally here. It is a mere 15 minutes. So if you were expecting an intense um, physical movie, you're not going to really get that. Uh, the fighters come in in very different ways. Rocky comes in wearing a robe with um, a last minute advertisement slapped on the back for the meat processing plant that, um, that, that uh, Polly works for. Um, he just is doing a favor for a friend and wearing that humiliating advertisement. Um, and then Creed comes in dressed as George Washington and also later emulating Uncle Sam throwing coins out. You see the difference between um, Creed's showmanship and the amateur sort of approach of Rocky. So in the fight, Creed comes on really strong at first and Rocky takes what seems to be punch after punch to the face with no attempt to block it. And it's just poof, 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 over and over again. And so uh, my students, it would drive them crazy when we watched it, especially the people who were familiar boxing with boxing. They're like, why doesn't he just <laughs> try to block his face? Um, but eventually Rocky is able to powerfully counter and he knocks Creed down. And this is when Creed and his team realize that this is actually going to be a fight. And so they go toe to toe for the whole 15 rounds we get the montage of the girls coming out with an eight, right? Nine, and so we speed up, we don't watch it in real time, but by the end, both of the fighters are hunched over, all bloodied up and bruised, eyes having been cut, ribs having been broken. Um, and in the end, um, <clears throat> Rocky has made it all 15 rounds. The winner has to be announced by decision, and it's announced in Creed's favor, but the way that this moment is shot, it's not even central to what we care about here. It happens sort of in the margins, even off screen. We just hear it, um, the audio cue. Um, and Rocky doesn't even care. He is calling the whole time for Adrian. She comes out of the locker room to meet him. And once they are reunited, um, they declare their love for each other. She says, I love you. And he says, I love you, <laughs> right? And it's really cute. And it ends with a close-up, freeze frame, fanfare, the end, okay? 
So at the 49th Academy Awards in 1977, Iraqi did pretty well. It had 10 nominations and one for three, including Best Picture, Best Director, and Best um, Editing. We will come back and talk about the critical reception of the film and the kind of competition it had, particularly for Best Picture, because I think that is leading us to something interesting about the film's place in New Hollywood cinema. So as you know, <clears throat> Rocky became the foundation of essentially two franchises. So Rocky two through five are a unit, and we follow our protagonist as he struggles with fame, struggles to maintain his family, and also starts losing friends as part of this experience. Um, and then after Rocky V, there's this one-off 2006 Rocky Balboa, which people didn't love so much because it felt very far removed from the original franchise. And then many people, most of my students, come to Rocky through having seen the Creed films first with Michael B. Jordan. And so there's been three of these, and Michael B. Jordan plays Adonis Creed, who is a... Um, do people still say, like, illegitimate child? Like, what is the... <laughs> He is a child of Apollo Creed. Um, sorry. And uh, anyway, so this is about mentorship, right, and about Rocky being able to do right by his friend, Apollo Creed, and mentoring his son to success. But Michael B. Jordan directed um, Creed Three and is slated to direct Creed Four. So all the recognition and all the sequels and all the money, which comes up to about, um, I think it was a billion dollars, um, are su only surprising when we understand that the film that started it all, that started it all, was a long shot underdog that struggled even to get on its feet. In 1985, Stallone was pretty desperate. He'd been acting and writing for a while. He was 29 years old. He had appeared in some films, had written some scripts, gotten some writing credits, but it's not what he wanted for himself. He knew that he could do more. Um, and so he was very, very close to um, throwing in the towel. And as an actor, he was struggling in particular to get cast as anything other than a thug, which he played here in The Lords of Flatbush, which I think came out the year before Rocky. Um, he blamed, or understood, rather, his lack of casting success to be a result of the distinctive slur and snarl that he has, which were actually side effects from a traumatic birth, or yeah, a traumatic delivery experience for him as a child. He was born in a charity ward, and they misused some forceps, and it led to some partial paralysis in his face. So he thought that this accounted for his lack of work. He was down and out and waiting for an opportunity. So a bit of trivia as we're here. This guy on the right, his name is Perry King, and the executives at United Artists, when they were trying to decide whether to greenlight Rocky, thought that was Sylvester Stallone. And so they were like, yeah, the guy from Lords of Flatbush is uh, gonna be in it, and he's also the writer. And they were like, well, what's he look like? And they were like, I think he's the blonde one. And so they greenlit it with an entirely different person in their mind, and so they weren't very happy later when they were like, oh, it's not that one, it's the other one. Um, and so their preference for this guy or wanting that will make sense in just a little bit um, when, they're talking, when I talk about who they envisioned for this role. Um, okay, so when he wrote Rocky, he was financially struggling. He had all of $106 to his name, and he was living with his first wife, Sasha, who was pregnant uh, with their first child in Encino, California. And he had just sold his beloved Mastiff, or Mastiff here um, because he couldn't afford to buy the dog's food anymore. Um, and there's some interesting backstory there about uh, the dog, which maybe we can get into after the presentation. But they were just struggling to make rent. And his mother, who had um, dabbled in astrology, told him to hang on. The right story would come. And so eventually, the right story did come. Um, in March 75, Stallone went to a movie theater in LA to watch a boxing match between Muhammad Ali, who had just toppled George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle. And so it was Muhammad Ali and Chuck Webner, which you know, right? Old Chuck Webner, <laughs> okay. So Chuck Webner, a New Jersey-based fighter known as the Bayonne Bleeder. Um, Webner was a 40 to one underdog. Um, but he somehow managed to drop Ali to the ground in the eighth round. 
And this is the moment where that happens and people are like, oh, it's because he stepped on his foot. Well, whatever, he still fell, right? <laughs> That's part of the game, man. Um, so beyond that, beyond just the knockdown, um, Wepner was able to hang in there for almost all 15 rounds. He did have to tap or it, he was, um, it suffered TKO and with seconds left of the match. And so Wepner lost, but he gave the champion of the world um, um, a big scare and the boxing world was really excited. So Stallone was really inspired by this fight and he had the seeds of an idea. He went home and drafted the story for Rocky in a little over three days. He wrote everything in this little red spiral notebook, which you could have bought for almost half a million dollars. Why didn't you, okay? Um, all in all, it was about 90 pages. And after some revisions, he shopped it around. And his big condition was that he would not sell it unless he could be in it. This was his story. He saw it as um, a reflection of his own experience in Hollywood, also being an underdog. So two producers from United Artists, Erwin Winkler and Bob Chartoff. Winkler's in the middle and Chartoff is on the outside. That's important because Stallone ended up hating Winkler. Um, and it's because of the way Winkler sort of swindled the rights of the screenplay out from Rocky as part of, or not Rocky, but Stallone as part of their deal. And so the franchise properties were technically the property of Winkler rather than Stallone himself who wrote the story. And I think um, Stallone became really sensitive about it in particular when Winkler was passing this property on to his son that you can only imagine, like a story that you wrote, character you created, um, being kind of stripped away from you. But anyway, these two producers initially offered him $100,000, which incidentally is the same amount of money that Rocky is awarded for just fighting with Creed, and I think that there's something there too. Um, but they, he wouldn't take it, so they went up as much, um, or to $265,000 if he would just let it go, because they wanted a bigger name for the picture. They wanted someone like Robert Redford, right, to star, which explains the appeal of the other guy, the other blonde guy with the hair, um, <laughs> is who they were imagining. But Stallone wouldn't cave, and so they agreed to let him be in the movie for $25,000, he could play that part, but they had the rights to the screenplay. And so this is what they went forward with. This was the agreement that they reached. The production itself experienced some constraints. Uh, Winkler and Chartoff had 30 days to shoot, which is not a long time, and they managed to do it in 28. They had a shoestring budget of about a million dollars, and what the producers had to resort to was taking out second mortgages on their homes to cover overages, and they did not tell their families until it was safe to do so, right, that they had done this, and so, um, which is something in their favor, right, that they believed in the story too, but I would not like that. Okay, so the studio didn't have high hopes, but the star clearly was a believer in the story. And so I wanna highlight some of the memorable things about the film that are necessitated by the tight budget. And the first one here is the ice skating scene. So this is their first date, they go ice skating, in the film, Rocky, it's already closed because it's Thanksgiving Day. And so Rocky has to pay the Zamboni driver who's cleaning the ice, has to pay him $10 for 10 minutes. Originally, this scene was supposed to have 300 extras, but the day of the scene, the producers were like, we're not gonna pay for all those people, <laughs> right? They couldn't pay for 300 extras. And so it became instead this moment, which I think is actually better because it allows us to focus on our protagonist and in isolation and seeing him kind of um, break down that hard exterior and connect actually with another person. And she's reciprocating too. Um, the other thing about this scene as a result of the 10 minute time limit is that the Zamboni driver intermittently is calling out how much time is left. He's saying 10, nine, eight, seven, which is a way to anticipate the countdown of a referee, like in a boxing match if someone's knocked down. So it helps us understand this scene as its own challenge for Rocky that he first has to get right in order for things to move forward. So the choreography here and the barrenness of the scene, um, I think emphasizes the stakes for the couple a lot better than if it were busy with like 300 paid extras uh, figure skating around. 
So in the training sequence shot that we have in the top right, he's running through Philadelphia, he's bolting through neighborhoods and markets, he feels really energized by all the lookers on who are running alongside him and they're cheering, but these are not paid actors. These are customers in Philadelphia's Italian market who have no idea what's going on, only that a man is chasing a movie camera down the street. But I think it helps you appreciate this scene better because the people are like genuinely excited for him, right? And they had no idea. A man throws him an orange and it's this nice human moment. They didn't know they were throwing an orange to a movie star. Um, but on location shooting, right, and not using non-professional actors, these are the hallmarks of neorealism, which we've talked about in the film class, right, from the Italians. And um, so it's, they were probably trying to evoke that Italian neorealistic style, but they also just didn't have money to pay the city for the permits to film. So it led to this moment here. So Rocky's corner men wear these really weird pink sweaters. And I think when you're watching it, you're like, why would you choose that color? And they didn't, okay? They were white, and then someone in the wardrobe department washed them, and it bled, and it turned this ugly pink, and because they didn't have a lot of money, they were like, I guess they're pink now. Um, and so this was um, a image from an auction, because you can buy all these kinds of memorabilia, but this was one of them. So also because of the budget, and they couldn't pay the extras that they needed to fill out the arena. And so they used a lot of low lighting to cover the depth in the back of the frame. And they intercut some stock footage from other kinds of sporting events to hide the fact that they didn't have the people that they needed. Um, so while we're here to, I wanna talk about some innovations associated with the film, not necessarily related to the budget, but just points of trivia that I think are really interesting. So Rocky debuts an important piece of film technology. Uh, before Rocky began filming, this guy, Garrett Brown, who's a Philadelphia-based inventor, created a demo video to showcase the capabilities of this new camera that he had created. And you see that it's a camera with a stabilizing system. Anybody know what this is called? What's this called, Jeff? Steadicam. The Steadicam, yeah. Um, so he used this harness and camera combo to record his girlfriend running down the steps of the Philadelphia Art Museum. They saw this footage, the Rocky team, and they're like, yeah, we're gonna do that. <laughs> so they got uh, Brown to work on the production and it, it, the steps that Rocky runs up, Garrett Brown's girlfriend first trod, okay? So the Steadicam is actually a super important innovation in film technology because of the way that it allows the camera to dynamically move um, in a steady way. So it's not a shaky handheld situation, it's not bound on tracks, you can get up close and personal, you can follow. Um, so this is, comes to revolutionize the way cameras move in modern movies and it had its debut in Rocky, which is pretty cool. So I wanna come back to this moment, and this is after Rocky accepts the challenge to fight Creed. Mickey visits him in his, his apartment to help as a manager. So Rocky's already been discarded by Mickey as useless and without potential, as a bum, but Mickey comes to him and he's pleading to be his manager, right? Um, so Rocky has to listen to Mickey's effort to conceal his own shame and desperation as he's making this request. Originally, the scene was supposed to end with Mickey quietly leaving the apartment and Rocky just sitting in his apartment thinking about it. But Stallone asked the director, give me one more try, I wanna do that again. And what we see in the final cut is all Stallone. The sort of explosive rage we see here um, is improvised by Stallone. And um, you see his, um, his rage and his resentment that help is being offered to him now. So when Stallone spoke of this moment in a documentary available on Netflix about this called Sly, he talked about how at this moment he was thinking of Frank Stallone Sr., who is his dad, who actually is featured in the film um, early on in one of the first moments as um, someone working at a fight. But anyway, um, Frank Stallone Sr. by trade was um, a barber, but he eventually got into horses and really loved polo. And Stallone was actually an accomplished polo player, but his dad always gave him a hard time, told him he wasn't good at it. 
it was one of those tense father-son relationships where Frank Stallone never really believed that his son would be anything and never had his support. And all this was driven by Frank Stallone's own envy of his son's success. And so Stallone says he was thinking of his father when he improvises this moment yelling at Mickey, like this how dare you come here now and try to support me and help me. So um, the rage that Rocky's able to show, or Stallone's able to show, contrasts really nicely with the humanity that we see throughout the rest of the film. And so when Rocky chases down Mickey in the street to make amends and invite him to be part of his team, that moment is all the more special because you can see, you can imagine now Stallone trying to work out things with his father in a way that he could never do in real life. Um, he does here. So in this scene, they make their... They make up under the diffuse light of a street light. It happens deep in the frame. It happens under this diffuse uh, street light. And we don't have to know what is said to know what is happening. This moment used to drive my students crazy. They're like, well, what did he say? And I'm like, what do you think he said? He said, I'm sorry, right? We don't need to know what he says. That part can be left out. But we can witness it as if we're there on the stoop with our cigarette and beer right, watching this happen, and it's immersive, and it's wonderful, and it uh, feels like a more organic experience. Um, <clears throat> okay, so in the wake of the film's release, the critical reception was not uniform. There were a lot of people who loved it, and there were some people who were like, eh, right? So Vincent Canby of the New York Times had this harsh thing to say. He said, it is a vanity production with a large hole in the center of the film. Ouch. Um, uh, Richard Schickel of Time said that the story is preposterous. Um, and Arthur Knight, though, of The Hollywood Reporter said that it's an ode to the human spirit that should make movie history. And Roger Ebert, Ebert said, we find maybe to our surprise after remaining detached during so many movies that this time we care. And moviegoers did in fact care a great deal. There were reports of people leaving the theater beaming and boisterous that finally they had a story that they could believe in and maybe even see themselves in. Um, Stallone says that when he went to screenings, people were cheering as if it were a real match. Um, <clears throat> so the film, as a testament to its popularity among wide audiences, made $117 million that year, which meant that it was the highest grossing film in 1976. The film's nomination for an Academy Award was a foregone conclusion. Arami, or Rocky was nominated, like I said earlier, for 10, and it won for three. The most surprising for me, and the most important for appreciating the film for what it means in American film history was its win for Best Picture. You may recall some of the fantastic films that came out in 76. So these were the other contenders for Best Picture. We have All the President's Men, which if you watch it today, feels very on the nose, right, for the relationship between journalism and politi or politics. And by on the nose, I mean it feels very relevant, not obvious. Um, Network feels the same way. Network is a really difficult movie, but as a, just as applicable as a commentary on our media culture as it now as it was then. Um, there's also Taxi Driver that came out that year. And the one that I haven't seen because it just seems really boring to me is Bound for Glory about Woody Guthrie. I'm sorry. Anybody seen that? Ooh, exactly. Okay. So uh, the image we saw, by the way, of Garrett Brown with a Steadicam, that was actually from the set of Bound for Glory. He was working on that, too. I just can't. Okay. Um, so... Taxi Driver, Network, and All the President's Men are all of the same post-Watergate pessimism, which Vincent Canby of the New York Times hailed as chic. In a piece published the day before he reviewed Rocky, he wrote this, which deserves to be quoted at length. So of the various films released in 1976, he says, none of these films taken separately is especially worrisome. Yet considered together, they demonstrate the extent to which the political events in this country in the 60s, for which Watergate was the grand finale, have shaped hopelessness as a perfectly acceptable popular attitude. 
When I say hopelessness, I don't mean anything as tough and positive as a tragic sense or even reasoned despair. Just lighthearted, lazy hopelessness. The shrugged shoulder, the street corner sage who avoids thinking, avoids making judgments or any commitments by saying that everybody's crooked, so what's the use? Relax, have a beer. The most we can hope for is to have some excitement before meeting a violent, utterly meaningless end. So this is a really bleak attitude to have rooted so deeply in the American consciousness, and it must have been really hard to feel this so palpably in the country's bicentennial, this 200-year anniversary, when there were 66,000 celebrations arranged around the country to celebrate this momentous occasion. In the bicentennial year, plenty of people felt like they were invited to a birthday party. They didn't feel like attending, which is why we have that dumb graphic there, okay? Of the other contenders, Taxi Driver sticks out to me as an interesting foil or comparison point to Rocky. Both feature down and out young men looking to find their footing, some sense of meaning and purpose. They're both really bad with women initially, one of them forever, right? Um, so this summer I rewatched Taxi Driver and it happened to be a few days before the assassination attempt of um, nominee Trump and I was sure that I was gonna be on some database because it was just too, the timing was like too much. Um, but anyway, it made that moment when we saw the footage of the, the Trump incident on TV even more bizarre. Um, so I was struck too by the training montages in both films, right? You have both guys disciplining their bodies for their big moment, one to win a fight or even to hang in there and one or to prove that he's not a bum and the other one to assassinate a politician because he thinks that's what's gonna make sense for his life. So at both Taxi Driver and Rocky are character dramas and overall I tend to think that Taxi Driver is the more interesting movie. It does things with character that are really interesting. It asks you to care about someone who is frightening, not just awkward, and it asks you to pity him, which is a really difficult thing to ask. And the direction is also really interesting in Taxi Driver, um, the use of the camera, the, um, the ending you could talk about forever, about like, wait, did he really save the day and is everything fine? But it's kind of hazy. Um, so you can endlessly debate a lot of things about Taxi Driver. It's a more discussable kind of movie in that way. <clears throat> but so Taxi Driver is the more interesting movie but Rocky is without a doubt superior in its humanity. And the Academy that year chose to award moral excellence above everything else. And I think there's something admirable in this. So Rocky's critical and popular success marks a turning point in new Hollywood cinema. While American movies have never had a really cohesive binding philosophy like other national cinemas, like uh, the French or the Italians or the Germans, the filmmakers of the 60s and 70s were probably most like those French and Italian filmmakers because they had these altruistic ambitions and they were committed to depicting life in this gritty, realistic way. So many of the movies at this point had been cynical, but Rocky, its critical success and popular success marks an important turning point where the mood was clearly shifting. People had had enough, right? Um, so describing the new enthusiasm for happy endings, a film critic, Jay Hoberman, has this to say. If Taxi Driver was Hollywood's last feel, or great feel-bad movie, Rocky created the template for the feel-good movies that would endure for the rest of the 20th century and beyond. So now think about what was around the corner in American movies in the 80s, the age of sci-fi heroes and action stars. So had people tired of the chic cynicism in movies of the past? It seems that they had. And the alternative to cynicism, as we know, is hope. And so the successes of Rocky in 1976 and in the year afterward of Star Wars, later renamed A New Hope in 1977, I think are related. Um, both elevate and educate the human spirit and both are essentially stories about hope. Really quick, I was super excited about finding these two matching images from the film. Like the color grading is the same, the figure placement. Uh, Sam, I'll talk to you. This is called a graphic match cut. 
if it were to follow in sequence, it's a graphic match cut because our graphic elements match when we cut between them, right? Um, but I thought that was really good. Okay. So as we approach the 50th anniversary of the film, we ought to take some time to clarify what Rocky tells us about the American dream. We know it takes hard work, we know it takes resilience, but something that impresses upon my mind when I watch this film is that you need those things, you need hard work, you need resilience, but it also understands that random, undeserved chance is part of what it means to be successful. And so Rocky has heart, we know that, but he doesn't get a chance to figure that out until someone actually bestows this chance upon him. And I think if the movie is part of our cultural understanding of what it means to succeed in America, it wants us to acknowledge that chance, either undeserved chance or grace or whatever you wanna call it, is sometimes part of the story. So I've enjoyed thinking carefully about this movie for the several months of preparation for today. I've been grateful that it has energized me to make the most of my own chances, to say yes to more things instead of that instinctive fear-based, no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, I appreciate that the careful attention to this film has reminded me that everyone wonders if what they are doing matters. Everyone wonders if they have any value at all. And the only way that we can know the answer to those two questions is to do something, right? So Jurgens asks Rocky at the very, or in the proposal, he says, do you believe America is the land of opportunity? He asks this in sort of a creepy way because it's part of the sales pitch, right? But I think that this question deserves attention today. So do you think America is the land of opportunity? I think it is, and I hope it is, and I want it to be, and I think you guys here want it to be too. So as we move forward at this very critical time, let's think about saying yes to the right things and giving people the chance to say yes to and to try new stuff. Uh, thank you. So if you have, if you want to fact check me or whatever, okay, <laughs> you can scan this guy and it'll take you to the text that I'm looking at that has the in-text citations for the things that I said. If you're like, yeah, but where did the pictures come from? I have that here, okay? So you can see this is a Google Slides version of the presentation that in the discussion below will have the image credits for everything that's not a still from the movie because I couldn't bring myself to cite all those gifts that I made, okay? It was just too much. They obviously come from the film, all right? Um, as I'm closing here, if you want to study abroad, um, my husband and I will be leading a trip to Portugal and Spain in May 2026. And if you're like, man, these seem really fun, I want to go with them, um, talk to me. There's also another QR code that you can scan. Um, as supporters of the uh, WCC community, you guys are more than welcome to come, and we would love to have you. I touched it, of course, at the very end. Um, Okay, so there is a red bowl somewhere. Yes. Bum, 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 bum. So in the, uh-oh, okay. So in the spirit of random, undeserved chance, <laughs> we're gonna do a drawing. I don't need to look, okay. Those are blank, okay. The card I'm drawing out is Dabrowski. <laughs> but wait a minute, but I don't like that nickname too much. So Rocky was chosen based on his nickname. Let's see if I can get another one. Ed Spence. Okay. No, no, no friend, no friend. Um, Ed Spence is not a good name, but I just want to stick it to Dabrowski. So you are the happy winner. I feel bad. I'll, I'll get you something else. Okay. You're going to take home this little Rocky action figure, which when my girls saw it, they're like, oh, he's cute, right? Um, so Ed, thank you for coming. This is for you. If you guys, this is now the time where you guys can tell me what you know about Rocky and where you're like, well, actually, right? And you can tell me whatever trivia or share with the room or if you have any questions, um, we have that time now. Or if you're ready to go home, we can go home. I think we just all need to give a big round of applause. Okay, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.
Thank you. You know what happened to the dog? The dog, okay. <laughs> I think Stallone loves the act of being his own myth maker, right? And so the story about the dog has shifted. Do you know the story of the dog? Okay, so he says that he sold Butkus, that little bull mastiff, because he couldn't afford the food. So apparently he sold it to a guy in front of a 7-Eleven for 40 bucks. And then once the film was taking off, he wanted to buy the dog back. And so he met up somehow with the guy, and the guy was like, yeah, you can have the dog back for $10,000. And so he ended up getting his pet back, and the guy who he bought it from is actually in the movie. So you know when he goes to Mickey's club, and he's like, where's my locker, right? And there's a little short guy with a push broom who's like, you know, they gave it away or whatever. That little guy is the 7-Eleven the dog buyer. <laughs> so he got a part in the movie and 10 grand for the dog. Wow. Liz. I, I really enjoyed the first movie a lot. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to the others because I thought it's just more of the same. The villain's just a different ethnicity or a different political entity or whatever. Yeah. Do you think when a film has sequels like that, it, it becomes outdated or, or do I do. I do think there's still something of value in each of the sequels, though. It is definitely not the robot that's part of Rocky Three. Dean, help me. The one where it's like, it's the future. We have robots in our house. Um, no, so I do think something gets lost because when you experience a character for a first time, that is hard to replicate. And so I don't think, though, that as audience members, we all the time mind when conventions are recycled or when tropes are recycled. It is part of the joy of the film itself, of, of a watching experience, is that you're like, oh, when's the montage gonna be? Like that anticipatory aspect. But I do think there's something about the artistic quality of the story that does diminish over time too many visits back to the same well. You did bring up something interesting about the shifting ethnic identity of the opponent. I think one of the important questions to ask about the original Rocky is whether it is a racist film. And some people have argued that because um, there is definitely racial elements here. I would say that the film acknowledges race, but the most important perspectives articulated by Rocky are not racist. So there's a scene in the beginning where they're in a bar and they're watching Creed on TV and the bartender calls Creed a racial slur. And Rocky's like, it looks at him with disgust. And so that's the implicit point of view of the film then, is our protagonist's point of view, that this is a disgusting attitude to have. And he says, what are you talking about? He's the champion of the world, what are you? And he's like, I just have a bar. And then like Rocky balls up the money and throws it at him. Um, and so it is the most vile characters in the film who say racist content. So Polly, for example, says something about Apollo Creed's lips. So there, it is a movie that acknowledges the reality of racism, and Creed himself sees this as a dynamic to exploit for revenue, right? Um, so the film acknowledges racism, but is not in any way, I don't think, endorsing a racist message. There, the scholarship, though, on that particular issue is varied, and you will find different perspectives. Yeah. Um, yes. There's a statue of uh, Rock in the uh, steps of the uh, library in Philadelphia. OK. I think um, they, he had a replica of that at his own house, too. Um, he's a very humble guy. Uh, different things, you'll see it. Yeah. Um, so the, the one that I think that was at his house was at the end of his big pool. He just recently sold that house, by the way, which was the occasion for the documentary um, on Netflix because he was going back through all his own memorabilia. And what you find out about Stallone through that is that he's actually a serious collector and maker of art. He is um, a talented painter in his own right. Um, but yes, the, the statue still remains and is a great photo op. Sam? Going back to the robot. Yeah. I believe it was a like therapeutic tool for Rocky's autistic son. 
Sylvester Stallone's autistic okay, son. Okay, gotcha. And that's why he casted it in the movie. Gotcha. I did not know that. So it was it was an actual aid for his real child. Because uh -huh. when it's in the movie, you know, like when you watch older movies and they're predicting what life is going to be like in the future and you watch it now and you're like, oh, gosh, they got it so wrong. Um, it feels like that. But, yes. okay. Thank you for that. So. Yes. What did Stallone actually reap financially after he kind of got bamboozled? Well, I, he definitely got the 25 grand, but I'm sure, I don't under, know the details of the contract, but I'm sure it was structured in such a way that if it were successful, he would get something. Yes. He wasn't completely ripped off. Other questions? I had a question kind of about what was happening in the 70s in Hollywood. Is this when like Spielberg and Lucas and all of those guys in the 70s were starting to just a whole Coppola, a whole Kubrick. group of people. Yes. Directors were coming on. How did this director fit in with that group? Um, Is he still part of the old guard? No, definitely of the new guard. So this um, brings up an interesting point in film history in the United States, is that our golden age of the studio system came to a close in 1948. The Paramount case, the Supreme Court decided, this looks an awful lot like a monopoly. We're gonna have to shut this down. <laughs> because in the studio system, the studios owned everything about the process uh, vertically, right? So from all the creative uh, talent was theirs, uh, the studios were theirs, and the problem was that even the distribution centers were theirs and the exhibition centers were theirs too. So they owned not just the studio, but the theater all the way down. Sounds like a monopoly. And so um, that broke up. So then in the 50s and 60s, you get more of what we know as the independent system now, which allows for more originality because movie studios were no longer movie factories just churning out the same pictures all the time, right, with this <laughs> different characters and stuff. Um, but it, it opened up the way movies were funded, too, instead of it always being a top-down situation. It gave artists more creative license to tell the stories they wanted to tell. And so also with the um, dismantling of the Hayes Code, too, which was a, like a censorship, um, um, kind of censorship rules about what kind of content could be featured in films and what couldn't, um, and that films had to be like morally encouraging. In our film class, I'm indicating Sam because he's in it, we looked at the, the verbiage of the Hayes Code. Um, so with, with that gone, the movies became more violent, more drugs, more sex. It's very much the you know, those kids of the 60s got, had the cameras and made the movies they wanted to make, and they're very different. There's a book that has just come out that I want to see, and I think it's called Raging Bulls and Free Riders, and it's about this class of filmmakers and how they changed the game to closer to what we know today. And Rock Me on the Water by Ron Bronstein really zeroes in on L.A. and what was happening you in the music, TV. Movies mm -hmm. in the 70s, yeah. it's like this golden age. She yeah. thinks, but I mean, I don't know. Gotcha. It did change movie making from the industrial complex of earlier cinema. It became more artistic, I guess you could say. Yeah, more variety, less control over stories. Other questions? Okay. Once again, Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate you being here. I think the foundation will probably need a break from me for a little while, but I'll be back at some other point. Um, maybe next time I, we just watch a movie together and talk about it, which would be fun. Liz. That's what I like the foundation to do, sponsor a film society mm -hmm. and, and have you lead it. Or, or anybody else who wants to talk, but I'm more than happy to facilitate, but I, um, in these years where I've been teaching the film class, like it was dormant at our school for a long time. Like we had it and then students weren't taking it. And I wanted to do it again because it is really fun to be able to experience film in a actual setting with your students and to be able to talk about it. 
So in our film class this week, we are gonna be watching Parasite, which has a lot of violence in it that always elicits a, like a <laughs> reaction from students. And so uh, that'll be fun to experience together, I think. Uh, but yes, I wanted to bring back films because I think they're really important ways that we can connect and they're highly accessible, creative. Um, they're the most accessible media that we have even though we're, our patience is running short for them because we only have 75 seconds of right. attention, right? Um, it now feels incredibly disciplined to sit down and watch a whole movie. <laughs> like You feel like a monk when you're doing it. <laughs> All right, um, other questions or comments? All right, thank you guys so much.